recent article on why the millennials are leaving churches. And out of the top 10 reasons, about four of them are all about it's cold, it's not a family, uh, no one seems to care. It's a lack of the one anothering. And they're leaving, a lot of them are just unsaved, that's why they leave. But many of them, there's no connection. And um, that's not just the millennial problem, that's everyone's problem, that we uh, can encourage uh, the practice of these to love our neighbor. That's what it means to love your neighbor, is practice all those 35 one another's, and then you're loving your neighbor. Well, we're looking this morning at the key elements of counseling one another. And uh, these are, uh, when you get into discipleship, both formal and informal, what's involved? What, what do I need to do with someone? If they're a Christian, and I'm a Christian, and I want to help them grow in the Lord, maybe I'm further along than they are in, in our walk with the Lord, and just how, what, what elements are needed? Uh, what key elements are needed? And I have some introductory comments there on your notes, uh, several bullet points. And the first, I just want to make sure, are we dealing with a believer or not? And that's to the best of our knowledge. Has this person truly turned from living for themselves to live for Christ? Now, I'm not talking perfectly, uh, but 2 Corinthians 5, 15, he died for all that they who live should no longer live for their own advantage, but now they live for the advantage of Christ, who died and rose again on their behalf, 2 Corinthians 5.15. Which way are they facing, living habitually, for themselves or for Christ? So I really want to focus in on that with people. And I want to take you to a passage here, just with that first, actually the first and second bullet points that you have. Are they living in light of their union with Christ? But I want to take you to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. We don't usually see Paul afraid much, but he says here he's afraid when he writes to the Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3. He says, but I'm afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning... Your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. Now, you want to know what Satan's great tactic is, it's that one right there. Uh, Just take your thoughts away from Christ. So your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. For if someone comes and proclaims another Jesus than the one we proclaimed, or if you receive a different spirit than the one you received, or if you accept a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it readily enough. And then he talks about false teachers, the super apostles that he had to deal with there in that passage. When I was young, I I was enamored, I grew up with three other brothers, and I was just enamored with magic. I thought that was a lot of fun and trick people. I couldn't figure out how people... They did think what they did uh, when I'd watch TV and watch magicians. And so I started doing a little reading on magic, and it's the art of deception and distraction. All right. I mean, for the most part, uh, the greatest um, magicians, and this is written by a magician, uh, the way to magic is misdirection. A good magician is skilled in directing an audience, their attention, where they want it to go, and so then they can do their, their trickery. And I thought, how interesting that the art of distraction, and Satan is a master at that, of trying to get our attention away from Christ. And some people have a different Jesus that they're following than the Jesus of the Bible. I was on a plane flying from Louisville to Atlanta, and this young couple was sitting next to me, and I had my Bible. I was doing some great, and they said, are you a Christian? I said, yes, and we are too, and we're just newly married, and so we're talking for, you know, 15 minutes, and I think I'm talking to some 
a brother and sister in Christ I had not met before, and I said, um, so are you from, uh, um, I'm sorry, going from Louisville to Dallas? I said, are you from Louisville? Are you from Dallas? Are you going through? And they go, no, we're from Dallas. I said, well, what church do you attend there? And they said, a kingdom hall. Oh my, okay, we're talking about a different Jesus. So now I had to reel it all back in and explain uh, your Jesus that you talk about is not the Jesus of Scripture. We've got, we're, uh, uh, and then it was a rough ride from there. <laughs> but it's so important when we're trying to minister to people, are we talking about the same Jesus? Are we talking about the same gospel? And so I would encourage when you are ministering to people on a regular basis, not sometimes just in the first uh, getting acquainted, but if you're going to seriously help them in a discipleship fashion, that you clarify terms, you walk through the gospel with them, just dialogue through the gospel with them. And uh, last night there was, a, I think, a footnote in uh, the first set of notes for the 180 uh, website, and there's a free download of an outline you can walk through. There's a whole PowerPoint you can download that just help people walk people through from, from teens, I mean, ki- kids on up to adults. You know, there's only one gospel. There's not a child's gospel and an adult gospel. Uh, there's just one gospel. So don't dilute it. Uh, don't abbreviate it. It's adult-like content that solicits a childlike response. The gospel of Jesus Christ. So as best as we can, we're trying to find out where is this person at? That's the foundation that we build on. Are they believers as best as we know? And there have been people that, well, actually more than I like to count, that I, after hearing their testimony, after walking through the gospel, they say, yes, I am. I've, I'm trusting in Christ. I haven't been living like it, but yes, I want to follow him and trust him. And I'm going, boy, your whole I mean, several years here does not reflect that. But I'm not to judge this one. Uh, God knows their heart. Maybe they haven't been discipled. Maybe they don't know how to change and grow. Some of the things we went over last night, they, they just don't, they've been letting go and letting God and they haven't grown. So I say to them, I will take you at your word, at your profession, unless your habitual actions or attitude deny your profession. In other words, your fr- there's no fruit and it's not a snapshot, it's habitual. It's the, the movie strip picture, not a snapshot. We all have more snapshots than we care to uh, own that don't look good. It's the movie strip film. Which way are you going? Towards Christ or towards yourself? And that's from Titus 1.16 that says, False teachers profess, but they deny their profession by their disobedient deeds. So you can cancel out your profession. So I just tell them, I'll take you at your word unless your habitual actions or attitudes deny your profession. And most people say, okay, fair enough. Now let's start looking at the elements of how to change and grow, uh, the heart and what goes on in the heart, and then these elements we practice as we seek to disciple and counsel of one another. So that's very key. Uh, another bullet point there that you have, I think the third one down, the Holy Spirit is essential in this change process. You can't change and grow without the Spirit of God. And so he indwells believers. In Romans 1 through 7, he's mentioned two, some, uh, some would suggest three times in relationship to our salvation. He takes the work of Christ and he applies it to our life and we're converted. We're born again of the Spirit. So in in relationship to our salvation, he takes the work of Christ, the accomplished work of Christ, and applies it uh, to our life, and we're born of the Spirit. But in chapter 8, on how do we live this life as a Christian, the Holy Spirit is mentioned 20 times. One chapter, 20 times. It's by the Spirit you walk. It's by the Spirit you mortify the deeds of the flesh. It's by the Spirit. It's by the Spirit. It's dependent work. Uh, We're praying without ceasing. The next bullet point, the importance of the church. There's very little in the scripture about you and Jesus. 
singular. It's y'all and Jesus. Uh, There's more plural pronoun through the New Testament than singular. It's not just me and Jesus. We're just going to grow and get out on the porch somewhere and away from people. When I first was saved, I thought I would serve the Lord in that way. I was scared of people. I was fearful of ever speaking in front of people. Uh, I had a fear of man on steroids. And I thought, well, I love the outdoors. I love camping. I grew up camping, backpacking. I mean, I just love anything that outdoors. So I'll serve the Lord in forestry. I'll help take care of his general revelation out there. And I'll look for smoke and be away from people and around animals. That, that was kind of my, my quest. I was, okay, oh Lord, I'll serve you, but out there. And he had other plans. And uh, I'll talk about that in uh, the last session. But this whole issue of the church is you can't grow in Christ the way that God has ordained you grow without other of God's people around you. All the one another's involve you and others. You can't practice those by yourself. I thought I did at least a little bit when I was single. I thought I had the fruit of the Spirit. I love myself, kind of myself, gentle with myself. I thought it was pretty spiritual, but uh, I wasn't as much as I thought. And then I got married. And married a wonderful woman, but I thought she was bringing me down spiritually because I was getting angry now. I wasn't angry before. (laughs) I was impatient, and I wasn't impatient with myself before I was married. I'm going, boy, I'm sinning a lot. I'm She's bringing me down spiritually. No, 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 no. That was all in my heart. People tend to squeeze you and your heart and what's inside comes out. And then little sanctifying agents come around like children. And they had more squeeze and more squeeze. And you thought your spouse and children was all about them. No, it's pretty much about your sanctification. About helping you grow in Christ. But being alone and away from people, you can think you're, you're almost Christian perfection. So we need the church. That's the body of Christ. Very, very important in this whole process of caring and loving Christ. And you can't love Christ and grow in that relationship without growing in your love for other people. 2 Thessalonians 1.3, Paul commends the Thessalonians. He says, your faith is increasing. And so is your love for one another. When one goes up, the other goes out. You can't have people close to Jesus and tight with Jesus and can't stand people. That's, you're, you're misguided. It's a counterfeit walk with Christ. The next bullet point is the importance of meditation on the word of God and prayer. Just the spiritual disciplines. Where are they at in that as you're, asking questions, trying to find out where is this person at. And meditation is not just thinking about Scripture, it's thinking about Scripture into application into your life. It's the bridge between knowing the Scripture and doing the Scripture. It's a miss, a a missing art and skill. One of the best books I've read recently is called God's Battlefield for the Mind. Uh, David Saxton one of the best reads on meditation that I've read. And it takes a lot of the Puritan works. And uh, if you're not meditating on Scripture day and night, you're probably sinning and giving into the flesh in some way. It's just that kind of importance that the Scripture puts on it. And then the reality of a spiritual war that we're in, a spiritual battle. When we're seeking to help other people, get ready. The enemy does not want this. The, bo- the, the enemy does not want the body of Christ to grow. Get distracted away from the head of the church, off of Christ. That's, I mean, that's his battle plan. And then get people not to care for one another. Don't get in the lives of other people. I mean, that would be his tactic. So we want to realize that we are in a battle. Second uh, Corinthians 10, our battle is not against flesh and blood. Uh, So we prayerfully need the Lord to work in a powerful way. Now with those uh, 
kind of introductory comments. Uh, there are, it depends on how you look at this, but I'm going to uh, mention all eight of these key elements. And they're listed there in your notes. This is a biblical methodology of how you disciple other people. And you just think about them, and, and it makes sense. I mean, if you just logically, you have to love people. We're called to love our neighbor. And this is personal involvement in the people's lives. You say, well, how do you even start? Well, sometimes just asking, how can I pray for you? will open up a big door right there. What's, what's heavy on your heart or, that I can pray for about you? But just involvement in the people's lives. Uh, secondly, a hope. Uh, people, if they don't have hope, I mean biblical hope, they won't, they won't persevere. They're going to give up. Now, I'm not, uh, don't be turning your pages. I'm just listing these. I'm going to walk through them. If you thought, boy, that was fast. Uh, <laughs> It really was. Oh, boy, we'll be done in 10 minutes. No, um, I'm just thinking, I want you to think about these. These are just key elements in how to care for people and getting in their lives. So hope is, do they have their, their mind fixed on God and his promises? Very important. If you don't do that, you won't persevere. You'll give up, you'll be discouraged, you'll be depressed. So hope is very important in counseling. Uh, thirdly, gathering information. We don't want to answer something before we've heard it. So we have, have to ask lots of questions. What's going on and really listen well. So this whole area of uh, gaining personal information or inventory is critical. Um, then you, once you get the information, then you have to interpret it biblically. What does the Bible say about this information? And then once you figure, uh, say, well, I think the Bible you know, puts this person, I think they're a believer, and this is what's going on in their life, then you move into, well, then you need to instruct them. This is what biblical counseling is most known for, is accurate biblical instruction, helping people think right, so in turn, with the Spirit's help, they then live right. You can't live right with if you don't have right doctrine and right thinking. So we're trying to help them think right, but in a dialogue way. It's not preaching to them. It's not a sermon. It's not a lecture. You're dialoguing through the scripture and the, and the teaching there. Once they hear the word of God, then are they committed to do it? Are they in submission to God's word, or are they trying to vote on it? But If they're in submission to the Lord, then are, by God's grace, they will do this. So you're looking at this this holy resolution to do what God says to do. And once that's there, then what are some practical things they can do to live out what the scripture says, what you just went over and taught them from the scripture? Now they have to do it, not just a hearer, but a doer, specifically and practically. And from there, the, the end result is not just that they're more like Jesus in the sense of they're more conformed into his image, but they in turn are helping others. So this is integrating them into the church where they're caring for other people. They're making disciples. They're reaching out to others. And that's the end result. It's not a dead end with them. They're changing to be more useful and fruitful in the body of Christ. So those are the eight elements. Now this is a patterned after Dr. Wayne Mack. He's written on these elements in a book on intro to biblical counseling. You could reduce those eight to four and Paul Tripp, Dr. Paul Tripp has written a book, Instruments in the Redeemer's Hands, where he has this love, no, speak, do. Well, it's those eight just sort of summarized into four. Then you go, well, then we or we could just go to Jesus and just love God and love your neighbor. There's two. <laughs> so you can reduce it, uh, but I like to expand it uh, with other, the different principles in Scripture that we can understand what it means to love God and love your neighbor, especially loving your neighbor and discipleship. So those are the, the eight elements. Now, let's start here with uh, number one, and I'm just going to highlight a few different things here that we get 
acquainted with them for some of you. Some of you have been teaching this material, maybe in your church or in small groups. Uh, so it's just reminding you, uh, and it's good. I, I teach this every year. Uh, I, we have a whole course just on this lecture. So th- there's a lot of hours of instruction and illustrations and uh, videos of uh, counseling going on where people are actually implementing these we really want to make sure we're discipling well. It's a practice and a skill you can get better at with the Lord's help. And I, I like teaching it because when I'm counseling, uh, I'm, these things are coming to my mind and it's good. I'm not forgetting as much as I used to. So I like teaching this material, even for that reason. Uh, involvement in care. I don't know that I need to spend a lot of time here uh, to convince you that we need to love one another better than we have been. And in our uh, culture and just in our society, it's not getting better, it's getting worse. It's, it's much more private and individualistic than it's been in years. I mean, you look at the stats on social media, the, the amount of time people are spending I was looking at social media. The average adult spends over two hours a day. Teenagers up to nine hours. I think that's low. I, I've watched the, like they, they, can't, they can't go almost 10, 15 seconds without looking at their phone. I mean, it, it's becoming highly addictive, enslaving and entangling. But the time, that's kind of away from people, but by yourself often. The TV watching is up. Uh, the adults are at least five hours, and it's just national stats. Teenagers can flux anywhere from seven, uh, three hours to seven hours a day. And then time spent in the Word. Lifeway did some research, and this isn't only for Southern Baptists, but this would be pretty indicative of a large sweep across the churches in America. 20% of the regular attending churchgoers, 20% of the surveys that came back, never, never read the Bible, ever. 40% read it once or twice a month. 20% read it every day, and then another 20 Five percent read it at least once per week. It's sad, and that's you go. Oh well, that would explain why a lot of it's like biblically anemic. I mean, we have no, we don't know what the Lord wants. Um, but it's just more and more aloof from people, more and more not caring uh, deeply. But we see in the scriptures in Matthew nine where Jesus loved people; he had compassion on the broken. Uh, those who broken over sin, broken over just suffering and trials. Uh, he was a good shepherd in John chapter 10. Hebrews 4 tells us because of Christ's humanity, he is our sympathetic high priest. So much so that there's not a problem that you are facing that he hasn't faced something similar to it and a whole lot worse. It should, his humanity should draw us close to him quickly. And you ought to think about that. You say, well, someone betrayed me. So did someone betray him. Well, you know, I, um, people don't like me. Well, they didn't like him either. They hated him. They actually crucified him. Well, my, you know, family rejects me. So did his family rejected him. You, whatever you're facing, it ought to draw you quickly to Christ. He is our sympathetic high priest. And I just want to encourage you, even in your own life, you know, don't quickly call friends and just go to him. He he will hear your prayers and he cares. We also see it reflected in Paul's life in Acts 20 where he said, day and night for a period of three years, I did not cease to admonish each one of you with tears. He cared for his people. When you see pastoral leadership in the scriptures, you see people who not only know the word and proclaim the word publicly, 
but also know the word and minister it privately. Jesus did that. There's only a few of his sermons that are in the Bible, but a whole lot of private ministry. You look at Paul's life and you see some of his sermons, but a whole lot of private ministry to the lives of people. This is really important. We're engaged in people's lives uh, with the scriptures. Now, how is care evidenced? You want to be available, but be faithful. You got to remember both of those. I can't be available to everyone else and be unfaithful in what God has mandated in my life. I can't ignore my wife. I can't ignore my job. I mean, I have to be faithful, but be available. Now, ways to develop compassion. Number two there in your notes on the second page. Showing compassion. Christ is full of compassion. When I got married... Uh, my wife uh, comes from a totally different background than I did. She comes from a very broken home. Uh, she was a victim of uh, criminal abuse. Uh, and God saved her at age 11, the only one that was a believer in her entire home. Uh, I come from a home with Christian parents, and I, ma- I was a Christianized pagan for many years. I made numerous decisions for Jesus, but wasn't converted. Uh, I just lived for myself. That every Friday night at a junior high camp or a senior high camp, I was throwing my sticks in the fire and I was going forward. But it, it was an emotional thing. It was not a genuine thing. I just lived continually for myself and I only wanted what I wanted. It was not a change of direction. I wasn't going to him for true forgiveness of sins and to live for him totally. Until I was 18. I was a, a boarding school up in the Smokies up in Asheville, North Carolina and um, the Lord just graced me with salvation at that boarding school. Um, but I, I grew up in that kind of a, a home with godly parents, my wife from a very broken home. So when we got married, uh, I was uh, my last year of seminary, uh, my fifth year in my three-year program. Uh, as I was working, I was working uh, as an associate pastor as well. But I met Zandra and we married and um, she was just full of compassion, coming from a broken home, um, and God saved her. She just dripped with mercy and compassion. I was like the truth. Uh, coming through schools, it's the truth. I was, you know, it's all, what, what's the truth here? You want grace? See her. <laughs> I mean, that's kind of what I was thinking. You, know? you want a lots of compassion and, and grace? See her. Uh, and I'm going to be giving the truth. Well, wherever we are not like Jesus, we need to change. We, we can't refer out for those qualities. You want compassion? See her. No, I have to learn to be compassionate. Wherever you are not like Jesus, you have to change. So personality traits are not in the Bible. So all those different things, well, I'm just this way. That's just the way I am. You know? I'm just the dominant A type. I just run over people. Well, you've got to change because that's sinful. Wherever we're not like Jesus, we must change. So I had to learn to be compassionate. I took one of those personality tests, and I scored really low on compassion, and it was on sympathy, but I didn't care. So how do you develop compassion? How do you develop compassion? Well, pray. Ask the Lord to help you. I mean, he's full of compassion. We want to be like him. Help me. Read about our God in Scripture. He's a God of compassion. Look how he deals with people, all kinds of people. How does he deal with his enemies? How does he deal with people when they fail, when they don't learn? I mean, you watch Jesus in the gospel. Just follow him as you read, and you're just going to see compassion incarnate. So reading about our God, praying, memorizing some scriptures about being more slow to anger, quick to mercy, full of mercy, about being more compassionate. He's full of compassion. Uh, 
follow around individuals. Be close to people who are compassionate. Don't just have a clique of people like you. Branch out and get close to people who are full of compassion. It's, it's, a lot of it's modeled, and they can help mentor you. Be around people who are hurting and ask yourself, what would it be like to be in their shoes? When I started counseling and people would say what was going on in their life, I thought, wow, that's got to be hard. I didn't, I didn't grow up like that. I, I didn't experience that. What would it be like to have done that? That helps you be compassionate. So it's just reading about people who, have been, who are compassionate, even biographies. But I would say I've, I've watched it in my wife uh, of her care for people. And when I'm ready to cut a tangled up relationship and rehook, uh, she's pressing on and working with the person and watching God just make a trophy of his grace. But just long-suffering, compassionate uh, if you don't have that around you, find it. There, there are people in your church who are full of compassion. So I would just encourage you, don't just say, well, I'm just, that's just not the way, that's just, you know, not who I am. You need to become that. Full of truth and full of grace. Jesus came full of truth and full of grace. A few other things here, and I won't cover all of them. I want to move down as you're getting involved with people and in a formal way, if I'm meeting with someone in a formal way, you want to observe limited confidentiality. I don't ever promise total confidentiality. If someone says, you know, I want to tell you something, but you can't, you have to promise. You won't tell anyone else. I can't make that promise. I would be violating scripture to make that promise. So you have to trust me. I will keep it as confidential as scripture allows me to. But if it's a criminal act, I'm going to go to the police. If it's, um, an unrepentant church member in, in sin, I'm going to go talk to the elders. Uh, the, the leadership needs to know. They're under authority there. If it's a, a, a minor, a, a child, and they're doing some things that their parents need to know, the parents are going to know. We're under authorities. And so there's no total confidentiality. You, you promise that you're going to get in trouble. You're going to end up probably lying because you will end up telling someone because you go, I, I can't. Someone needs to know about this. So just biblical authorities. Number 11, again, I'm just skipping on these. There's no fill in the blanks. So you can, uh, number 11 is remember when you're helping others, God is also working on you. Uh, the Holy Spirit does not take a sabbatical on your sanctification for an hour as you meet with someone. He doesn't say, well, Stuart's fine for an hour here. Let's just work on this person. No. It's amazing the people that God brings across my path. You say, uh, can we talk? Can I, uh, there's some things I need to work on. I'm going, now I'm asking, Lord, I wonder what areas of my life need. I need to shore up. I need to uh, get it more in gear. Maybe I'm coasting in some areas. Uh, he's working on our sanctification, I mean, I have sat across some people and I've watched in marriage counseling, a wife saying, he just doesn't get it. I said, get what? Well, I'm trying to explain this to him. And then she explains it and I'm going, I've heard that before just the other day. Sandra was trying to tell me that. Uh, you know, it's it, our growth as well, not just their, their needing help, but just getting involved, but being faithful. Don't overextend yourself so that now you're unfaithful and mandated areas of your life. You, just, you have to be faithful in everything. I'd love to, but I can't right now. There's some things I have to say to people. I'd love to, but I can't right now. I can only counsel so many and then supervise so many and still maintain everything else in a faithful way. But be available. Number two, hope. Hope. If you don't have hope, you don't persevere. And... You can lose hope, at least not positionally hope in Christ, but you can lose it uh, on your focus in your mind. Even in Peter, the Apostle Peter says in 1 Peter 1.13, you, you need to fix your hope back on the, the revelation on, on Christ's soon return. 
You need to get your eyes back upon him. The psalmist says, uh, soul, why are you in despair? Soul, hope in God. So we can, we can kind of lose focus off of God and his promises. Now, how to inspire hope? It's going to come through the scriptures and looking at the person of God, who he is. Not what you think he looks like through your circumstances, but who he says he is. And one uh, lesson I learned from the, the 10 spies back in Numbers 13 and 14, if it's a help to you, uh, I would come home uh, from a day at work and Zondra would say, so how's the day? And I went, oh, well, this happened. These people are leaving the church and then the, these bills came and then this and then that. And she said, oh, well, that's depressing. And I said, well, you asked me. And I, when I was reading through Numbers 13 and 14, the 10 spies did the same thing. They came back from spying out the land and they said, there's walled cities, and that was factual. There's giants, nine foot 10, that's a giant. Uh, there's giants in there and there's walled cities. And the scripture says they gave a bad report. One translation says it was an evil report. What was so evil about it? It was factual. They left God out. They left God out of the report. It's the facts without God. It's a bad report. It's a depressing report. You, you talk about your day and you leave God out, it's a depressing report. And you know what God did to those spies? He killed them and their families. But Joshua and Caleb didn't deny the facts. They're walled cities, Jericho. There's uh, giants, David. And Goliath, I mean, there, there's some big people there. Uh, there's giants and there's walled cities, but God. God told us to go, so let's go. And he's with us. And they were blessed. If you want to watch evil and bad reports today, just watch the news. It is depressing, isn't it? It is very depressing. Well, for more reasons than, than just, they're not even reporting the facts. I mean, uh, but... <laughs> But the news without God doesn't give hope. You need to say at the end if you watch the news at all, but God. But God is in charge of this. Everything's moving the way God has ordained it to move. He's working. He's building his church. You have to add but God, and that brings hope. Very important when I'm listening to people, do I hear but God? And so I've said to Zandra, if I ever say, you know, this is what's happening, and I, I don't bring in but God, would you please remind me that it needs to be hope-filled? I don't know what's going to happen here. We're, we're in a, 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 an issue right now. My wife and I, we're trying to deal with a, a particular situation. And if I just think of the facts without God, it's very depressing. But if I think of the facts, I, I don't know what God's going to do, but he knows, he cares, he, he's going to answer in a way that brings him glory. I have hope. My hope is in God and his promises. So I just really want to, you, to encourage you, uh, be a model of that in your own life and help others. Number three, oh, I'm going to have to pick up the, the speed here. Number three, and there's eight of them. Uh, inventory, it just means ask lots of questions. Lots of questions. And I put here, uh, let's see here, diagram right there. You have intensive and extensive questioning. Uh, if someone says, I'm struggling with this issue, let's say it was um, the, in their physical health area, then blitz that area with questions, intensive questions. That's a lot of them. Uh, tell me all that's going on, how long it's been going on, and we're not a doctor, or maybe some of you are, but I, I just want to know what's going on in the outer man and encourage you to see a physician and tell him or her about that. 
But then in the inside, just questions in every area of their life. No issue is isolated. How is this affecting your relationships? How is it affecting you at work? If you're, you have a job, how's it affecting you in your schoolwork? I mean, all of the different areas of your life are affected. So probing intensively the area that they say they're struggling with, and then some questions in every other area, that takes time. And you can't do that in 10 minutes. It just takes time. And what I have found, people don't mind spending the time talking about what's going on in their life. I've found people don't get tired talking about themselves. I mean, if you're going to take a couple hours and really get to know them, they're really appreciative of that. Because when they go see their physician, they've, they're given, at least the insurance will, will pay them only for 15 minutes of a session with you when you go see them. Usually they try to get it done in 10 minutes so they can see more people. Uh, my brother was a physician. And he just told me, he says, he's listening to the person for the first five minutes. After that, he's not listening. He's already thinking what test to run or what's the the solution. So you don't go there and say, well, it all started back when I was five. You're not going to get there. And he's going to, they're going to, you have to be really fast in that first few minutes. But when you say, no, just take some time here and we can take breaks. I really want to hear and ask and probe and follow up questions. So that's this whole number three. It's just asking questions in all kinds of areas. I did put a thing there, relevant questions. Stay on track with what they said they're struggling with. Don't go off in curiosity. I did that once with a guy. He just was enslaved to ice cream and ate a lot of it every night. And he said, I I need self-control. And I said, well, okay. Uh, He was running marathons. I thought, um, so this ice cream, oh yeah, it's the best kind I've ever had in my entire life. What question do you think I asked him that I didn't need to ask? <laughs> That's right. I asked, well, what kind is, is so entangling? And he told me, I didn't write it down, but on the way home, Zandra said, could you stop and get, she called me, can you stop and get some bread for supper? And I said, sure. And then I went to the frozen food section, I'm looking... <laughs> What kind of ice cream has a hold on people like that? And I found, a, I found the, the, the brand, and, the, and you're probably thinking, what kind was it? <laughs> I got a little, a little pint of it, went home, put it in the freezer. I didn't tell Zondra about it, didn't want to cause her to stumble. <laughs> I ate it that night, and I thought, oh, this is the best stuff I've ever had. <laughs> then, every time I'm at the food store, I'm buying a bigger quantity, and I, Zandra said, you got, you got to taste it. I mean, I, and she said, this is unbelievable. I'm still meeting with this guy, and he's going, boy, it's so hard. I'm going, yeah. Is it? <laughs> Finally, I had to just stop uh, going down that aisle uh, before it was becoming a habit. Uh, they don't sell it anymore. I've looked. I think it was probably laced with cocaine or something. <laughs> But you know what Galatians 6, 1 says when you're helping someone who's caught up in some sort of struggle or sin issue? You know what it says? You know what the Holy Spirit says there? Be careful, lest you too be tempted. So we've got to really be careful of our questions, uh, of our own walk with the Lord, even when you're listening to people and things that are going on in their life. So just asking Uh, All kinds of questions, getting the information. I want to go to number four. Oh, there's so much more I would want to say here, but the time just doesn't permit. Biblical interpretation. Now we're looking, what does the Bible say about who I'm talking to? Where are they at with Christ? What are the issues going on in their life? What does the Bible say? Uh, Now, Jesus is our normal Wherever we're not like Jesus, we're not normal. You don't compare yourself to 99% of the population. Well, everyone else is doing this. That's not biblically normal. It may be culturally normal, but it's not biblically normal. Jesus is our plumb line, and the Bible is our standard. But our culture says it's okay. The Bible says it's not. 
So God, what God says is truth, and that's what we adhere to, and Christ is our standard. And so we're comparing all the information with, uh, with him and what, what the scriptures say. So we're looking for themes and patterns. It's uh, letter B there under uh, number two. Just are there things in their past that they've grown to be habitual in particular areas? I'm trying to use uh, biblical words, if at all possible. Uh, One lady said she fudges on the truth. And this was early on when I really lacked compassion in counseling. I said, so you lie. (laughs) She was stunned. She's like, uh, she fudges on the truth. And I, do you lie? And she said, well, uh, little white ones. I said, I don't think they come color coded. <laughs> but I had to grow in compassion. But the truth she needed to hear, it's lying. It's a sin and needs to be repented of. Don't, don't excuse it. So I try to stay away from psychological labels if at all possible. When they come in and they've got all of these initials for all kinds of issues in their life, I'm just asking, so tell me what's going on. Tell me what's going on. Tell me about your behavior. Tell me about what you're thinking, what you're wanting. And I just try to steer away from all those labels because often they take them on as their identity. You know, I'm just bipolar. That's who I am. You go, no, tell me what's going on. So trying to ask more questions, and when they tell you what's going on, the more you know the scriptures, the more you go, oh, the Bible talks about that, the Bible talks about that, the Bible talks about that, and addresses these issues. And so we want to put the data on a witness stand and ask questions. Where are they at with Christ? We want to, do they understand, this is letter C under number five, do they understand how to grow and change? 80, I think at least 80% do not know how to grow and change as a Christian. They are, they are very much passive in their Christian life. Let go and let God. If you go all the way down to the letter L under number five, on page five, is there anything about their outer man, things that they're telling you that seem like they need to go get a good medical checkup? There's things that they're saying that happen that they can't sleep at night. I'm going, well, what are you thinking about? I'm not really thinking about anything, but after a while I start thinking, I need sleep. But I'm just as wide awake as they come. And Well, you know, if you talk to your doctor about that, I mean, it could be our, whether you're eating things, uh, caffeine or something that's uh, keeping you awake or maybe hormonal changes going on, but it just doesn't sound like something that may be a spiritual issue when you've asked all kinds of other questions. Like, I, not that I know of. I, I just can't sleep at night. Well, Let's just see what the doctor has to say and some tests that can be run, maybe even sleep apnea, see if there's any things going on there. Uh, But we're looking outer man, inner man, and that whole connection. And then you want to distinguish number eight down at the bottom, what's real fruit and what's root. What's the heart, what's out into behavior? When I say heart, I'm talking about what a person wants and what they think. What they want and what they think. That's root. That's heart. Out of the heart come flow the issues of life. Behavior flows out of our heart. And then there's a strategy and a plan. My first sessions, I'm usually just trying to uh, gather information and give hope. And then I'm wanting to go over the gospel with people. And then I'm wanting to explain the heart and what goes on in the heart. And then I want to say, okay, this is where we're at. This is where we need to go. Do you know how to change and grow? And I want to cover those areas, and then I want to uh, keep taking one issue at a time and start working it through in their life. It's, it, it, counseling is highly the, uh, theological. It's not psychological. It's theology. It's who God says man is, man's problem, and man's solution. That's theology. So anyone who says, I want to study psychology because I want to help people. Oh, I'm glad you want to help people, but you need to study theology. That will help you understand people, people's problems, and people's solutions. And what you can see here is when I'm going over all of this stuff, you don't need a PhD to understand this. It's biblical counseling 
uh, it, it's simple, but it's not simplistic. It, 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 there's a lot to cover with people and trying to help them in a, in a Christ-like way, but you don't need a PhD to understand it. So it's simple, but it's not simplistic. We're trying to do a thorough care uh, on, uh, for people. Now let's go into number five. Boy, I'm, whew. Uh, accurate biblical instruction. This is where we're trying to help people uh, to think right, to believe what's right. Now this is a challenge because of the statistics that I just read earlier. How much time are people in the word? Very little, overall. You, you all would be the exception. Overall, people are not reading the Bible. So they're not thinking the way God wants them to think. So we have to help them. They're not living right because they're not even believing and thinking right. So we've got to put in their mind truth or stir them up to remind, remind them of truth they've been taught. So as I'm looking at this, I'm just going to highlight a few items here. I go to number uh, letter C, uh, number three letter, there's A, B, C, and D. It's on page seven. When we instruct, it has to be biblically accurate. We really need to be good students of scripture and keep growing in that skill. And I'm so thankful that you're coming, so many of you, I don't know all the different churches represented, but where you have faithful teaching and preaching of God's word where they're really seeking to be accurate with the scriptures and the context and verse by verse kind of thing. But know the meaning of the words that you're using from the scripture. So if you're gonna talk about love, you need to know what love is biblically because the person in front of you is thinking love languages. Love languages has nothing about the gospel in it. The whole book doesn't even cover the gospel and doesn't even mention the Bible. It, it's more of I give to you something and you give something back to me. It's sort of uh, I'll scratch your back if you scratch mine. God's love is so radically different. It's giving to what you really need, maybe not what you want. And it's sacrificial kind of love. I will give even if I don't get anything back. It is so not like the world's kind of love. So know the meaning of important biblical words and determine that meaning, letter B there, in the verse, the passage. Know the verses before and after so that you get the proper context. This is just called hermeneutics or good Bible study skills. Interpret with the rest of scripture. You have one divine author. He doesn't contradict himself. And then letter D, Christ needs to be the end of all your study. You should always get to Christ as you study scripture. He is the end. Uh, that's Christotelic. He's the end in all of our study. Number seven, when you instruct, be sure you're differentiating between what God commands and your suggestions. Uh, God's commands are very important. You don't vote on those. But there's many applications. And sometimes in our own lives, our applications can get on the level of a command. And this is the way you have to do it. You're going to love your wife, you have to have date night. Date night is not a command in the Bible. It's an application. And there's thousands more. But don't say, a way has become the way of loving my wife, and this is God's way to love my wife. And that happens in so many venues. There are tons of these kind of issues. As parents, we're to raise our children in a way that honors Christ. We need to have disciplined training. We need to instruct their hearts. I can't save them. You can't save your kids. You can't sanctify them or save them. That's a work of God. So we're to instruct them, we're to discipline training. Now, there are many ways to do that. Some people will send their kids to public school. But they, at home, they are working hard. 
and doing exactly what the scripture says to do as parents. Some send them to Christian school, some homeschool. But you dare not put a way, this is the way to do it, and it's the way, and now this is only this is God's way. If you don't do it this way, you're sinning. No, no, no. The command is be faithful in teaching and training. That's it. So a single parent can do that. Just be careful of a way becoming the way becoming God's way. Very destructive in lives and churches. Uh, I, I listed several places you can get additional training. If you want additional training, I mean, there's all kinds of venues to uh, learn more and more about how to disciple others in a counseling kind of way, in an intensive way, better. There's schools, there's training centers. So I listed several, and there's even places where people can go and get some serious help and live there. And what they get is biblical counseling, but it's at a facility, whether uh, self-harm or uh, drug addiction, alcohol. There's uh, a few places there that I listed if someone has to go live somewhere for a while. Then we need to meditate on the scriptures. Number six on page nine. Sorry, I'm, I'm moving fast. I'm already over time. Number six, this is the holy resolution. And I listed a few passages there, but if you want to look at a couple, Psalm 101 and Psalm 108. I wish I had the time to look at that. David's saying, I will do this. 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 And I will not do that. And I will not do that. He engages the will. By God's grace, I will do what God says to do. It's not whether I feel like it or not. It's the right thing to do, so I will do it. A lot of you got up out of bed and are here this morning. It wasn't because you felt like it. You said, this this is going to help me grow more in my life, my relationship with the Lord. Uh, It's the right thing to do. It's the most helpful thing to do. But you went against feelings. You can't trust feelings, and you shouldn't be led by them. So that's what we're after when we're talking to people. I just want to know that you're going to do what God says to do by the help of the Spirit. Then number seven, homework or implementation, or some people call it growth projects. All kinds of homework assignments that you can do uh, on number seven. I'm going to list a few of them here. There's a couple of examples I, I use Uh, Reasons for homework, it translates what you just discussed now into action. They were a hearer of the word in your counseling time because you went through a scripture passage or two with them. Now they need to implement it. They need to be a doer of the word. So you're going to help them with some assignments. If they don't like the assignments I give them, they can come up with their own. But we're not leaving without some. I don't want you leaving and not becoming a doer. So what are you going to do to apply what we just learned from the scripture? So theology is application, to quote Dr. John Frame there on number two. But very important uh, that we assign work for them to do. Uh, The first thing, I'm going to skip right over to number 12, and that's not a misprint. I would have put a 300 font if it didn't waste paper or waste trees. Scripture. Don't miss using scripture and helping people in the counseling. I mean, for homework. People go, oh, we have this book. There's a book on everything now, almost everything. There's all kinds of helpful resources out there. But they should be supplemental. Any other book than the Bible should be in the back seat. And you can refer to those. And people can walk through those. That's great. But the scripture is front and center. This is God's word It's what he uses to bring sanctification. Assign them uh, something to study and think through and observe and put application points. Memorizing and meditating on the scripture. Then you can use pamphlets and books and various other assignments. One I use is a, a journal gathering information. This was a guy who was angry a lot. He said, I'm angry all the time. I said, well, this week, actually, I gave him two weeks. We were gone for two weeks. I gave him two of those exact homework assignments there. And would you just put an X where, where, when you just, man, I'm angry. 
Just put an X there. And then on the back side, tell me what was going on, just brief points, what was going on, who was involved, what you were wanting, and how it was resolved. That's why just on every one of those times that you get angry, what was the circumstance, who was involved, what was I wanting, and how was it resolved? And he came back with his wife, because he was an elder at a church, and he, he says, I, I, maybe I need to step away from being an elder because I'm angry all the time. And he put down two papers that looked almost identical. And he says, we noticed something. Yeah, I do too. He's not angry all the time. He's a weekend warrior. Friday night, Saturday, and Sunday, there's a lot of anger going on. And as I turned it over, he was telling me, I've got a real problem with my number three son. And then I have a problem with my wife because she, she kind of stands up for my number three son. And he is not what the son I wanted. He doesn't do what the other two boys do. And they were older. Uh, this number three son was in his late teens. The other two were in their early 20s. And this was a family that was all committed to outdoors, lock, load, spit, chew, It was sports, uh, I mean sportsmen, uh, hunting, fishing. And this number three son, God in his wisdom and providence gave him a son. Uh, He had a bow, but it went with his violin. And this was unacceptable, unacceptable. He wanted all his, he he had a, a desire for a family that became idolatrous. It was a family that he defined what the family was going to be like, not what God wanted, what he wanted. And everyone had to be just so. And if someone got, was outside his altar that he's bowing down worshiping, he's going to come around and try to push him in. And then his wife would stand up and she'd get his wrath and anger. And so he understood wow, the heart, worship of the heart, it's idolatrous. And he confessed, repented, and what a change in his life. He confessed not only to his son, but to the other two sons. And he turned them against their brother. And just to see the, the changes that occur. But this was a homework assignment that gave me a lot of good information. Journal, just journal. So I worry all the time. Can you just put an X when, when you say, I'm worrying, and then what is it that you're thinking and wanting? Emotions are feeling responses to what we want, think, and do. Feelings are, I mean, emotions are feeling responses to what we want, think, and do. So we need to ask, you know, I'm angry. Well, tell me what you're wanting and what you're thinking and what you're doing. You don't just sit around and get angry. None of you are sitting there just getting angry. You've got to be thinking something and wanting something to get angry. And then another chart I'll use on handling one's past, taken from Dr. Steve Byers, where when you're, I'm, I'm finding out about their whole past and what's gone on, not to be Freudian and blaming everything in their past, but trying to find out what has influenced them in their past, you can get into, um, right there, people come in and they've been sinned against, they're innocent, or they're guilty. They've sinned in some way. So guilty, innocent. This is guilty and haven't resolved anything on, on our part. And this is innocent and haven't talked to anybody about anything that's happened to them. So there are scriptural principles on how to go from here first up to there. So you go to the people and you ask for forgiveness if you're able to do that. And then over here where you've been innocent and sinned greatly against to maybe there's principles there to go up and where you, as much as possible, you live at peace with all men. And now, I've done what I can in talking with the individuals, if you're able to do that, and there's some qualifiers there, so that we live on that top level, authentic suffering, and thank, thank God that there's been forgiveness of sin. So it's a way to subdivide your past. It's not all one big lump. Uh, I've sinned and I've been sinned against. And it's trying to split that apart and help people work through. These are just some samples of, of some assignments that you can give. Uh, don't miss attending church, reading your Bible, prayer, um, 
things like that. The last I, or last element, key element, is once the word of God is being integrated into their lives, this is on page 12 of your notes, once the word of God has been implemented into their lives, they're beginning to, to do what God's word says, they need to be reaching out to other people. And you can tell when a person, I'm backing off now, I'm only meeting once a month, and then I don't meet anymore on a regular basis, when they uh, can tell me what happened, why they came in for counseling, what they did to change with the Lord's help, uh, and now they are interested in helping other people. You're more useful and fruitful than you were. Praise God, we don't have to keep meeting like this on a regular basis. So I know it's time to graduate them. Dr. J. Adams calls it terminating them. And I'm like, nah, I don't think that I like that word. I think Arnold Schwarzenegger and it's just like end the person's life and it just doesn't work for me. But graduating them is maybe a better word in, in discipleship. And in conclusion there at the end of um, page 12, all that we do uh, is to be done with the help of the Holy Spirit within the church, the community of saints, and it's all for the glory of God. Uh, We're helping others because we're concerned about God's glory and their sanctification as we're growing ourselves. So whether you take eight elements, key elements, or you reduce them to four, love, no, speak, do, or you reduce it to love your neighbor, it's all one and the same. And... um, I pray that you'll, just a good review of some of the things that are involved in discipling others.